Good morning. All right, people. Good morning. All right, we're going to have a dynamic panel here. I want my panel to come on out. Um, we are hopeful that we can energize you and continue to carry forward what I understand has been a fantastic dialogue over the last several days. So, please have a seat. The, the, let's just jump right into this. Rather than me introducing the panel, let me start with a question to you, and a, a statement first of all. Almost 60 years ago, Robert F. Kennedy in a speech said that uh, there's a Chinese curse which states that may you live in interesting times. And 60 years ago, he said, like it or not, we live in interesting times, and there are times of danger and uncertainty, but there are also times that are the most creative of any time in the history of mankind. And uh, the question of interesting times and, and the 60 years ago is nothing compared to the times that we live in today. In fact, there was a cover on June 8th of The Economist magazine that said, the title of the cover, some of you may have seen it, was Weapons of Mass Disruption. And it had a bomb on it with tariffs, tech blacklists, financial isolation, sanctions. Um, it, it, so the, the, the weapons of mass disruption, as, I'd ask each one of my panel members, let's start off talking about mass disruption this morning. Introduce yourself and then talk about what's required to catalyze the necessary action to achieve the SDGs and that mass disruption and what is your organization doing to provide that mass disruption. Starting with you. Mr. Minister, uh, introduce yourself and then talk to us about what the government of Nepal is doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, Kiran Rupakheti. Uh, I work as a, a division chief of uh, uh, good governance and social development of uh, division of National Planning Commission of government of Nepal. And I'm also a focal person for the nutrition related issues in the country. Um, I've been working for the government for the last uh, 30 years or so. So regarding uh, the role of the government and uh, a very, uh, I mean, uh, impressive quotation, uh, weapons of mass disruption. Actually, government has uh, been uh, always and should play a role in this regard. Uh, regarding my organization, for example, National Planning Commission, it has uh, been given a very important role. Uh, the organization is being chaired by the Prime Minister. And this is an organization uh, working also as an apex planning body of the country. And it's a platform to bring different stakeholders together. Uh, and uh, the basic role that has been given, and I'm also doing the uh, same, is uh, formulating uh, monitoring and evaluation of development plan, policies and program, including the uh, creation of sustainable you know, food system in the country. Um, we have very interesting you know, fact and figure in case of Nepal. For example, the stunting is still 36%. I mean, uh, children suffering with anemia is almost 50%, and food insecure household is more than 50%. So amid all these you know, uh, situations and realities, so government has been trying, um, especially through my organization, National Planning Commission, we uh, forecast resources and uh, uh, provide budget ceiling to the organization to ensure earmarked uh, budget for the uh, nutrition sensitive and nutrition specific interventions. And if I consider, um, I mean rightly, so we have been given uh, high emphasis on uh, agriculture related you know intervention as well focusing on sustainable food production system uh, so basically uh, my role in this regard in order to you know uh, break the boundaries in a way a uh, sort of barriers you know to ensure a sustainable food system is to uh, give uh, policy focus uh, ensure the uh, budget for the necessary intervention and also uh, evaluate and monitor whether 
the earmarked budget is uh, properly uh, used in a prudent way. Well, thank you, Kieran. Uh, let's go to you, Charlotte, and talk specifically. Introduce yourself to the audience and talk about what you and your organization are doing to disrupt and to create the change that is necessary to help us ensure we achieve the SDGs. So I'm Charlotte Sofer, Associate Vice President at IFAD. It's a UN agency based in Rome. Uh, working with agriculture, food, uh, together with other Rome-based agencies such as the World Food Programme and FAO. And we are working really with the smallholder farmers living in the rural areas in the most difficult circumstances, helping them to grow more nutritious food. And we also help them to access market, working through, for example, Hilton and Mars. We also work on a policy level and we're working towards a uh, Food System Summit in 2021. And, and I'm going to go right to you, Nancy, and ask you to introduce yourself and talk about what WBCSD is doing, but specifically speak to that Food System Summit and what are you doing to ensure that we have mass disruption that results in not just another meeting from the business side. Thanks, Arthur, and hi, everybody. Diane Holdorf. I'm the managing director of the Food and Nature Program at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's one of the six big systems areas that we work on bringing business together, leading businesses together to actually create this type of urgent action that we need to shift these big systems. So we're working specifically in food. We started Three years ago, actually, a program called Fresh in partnership together with EAT in anticipation of the EAT Lancet report that would, for the first time, integrate the science of what it takes to feed healthy people within planetary boundaries so that we could also continue to safely enjoy a healthy planet. And that program of Fresh brought forward a number of business led opportunities together with many of our members and partners who are here in the room mm -hmm. around dietary shifts, addressing the true value of food, much like Jeremy was just speaking about in Folu, another a partner of ours, and what do we need to do to continue to get after food loss and waste. Now, what are we going to do going forward? We need to really look at these key transformational pathways, again, where business can and must lead in partnership with others to get clarity on what are some of those big, big issues that we can uniquely address and drive action against, much like we did going into the climate summit mm -hmm. when we brought climate smart agriculture together uh, around business leadership in the ag space there, connecting that now with the food work that's been underway within Fresh and bringing those types of solutions forward into the types of big convenings that Charlotte just mentioned, like the Global Food Summit in 2021. So I appreciate what you're doing from a global level with business. Matt, you're working in Asia. Can you introduce yourself and speak specifically about what your organization is doing with businesses to address the, to, to disrupt? And more importantly, as just as importantly, uh, what, if anything, are you doing to support the Food Summit as it goes? So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Matt, Matt Kovac. I work at an organization called Food Industry Asia based in Singapore. We work with um, all of the, pretty much all of the big multinational food and beverage companies, as well as big Asian um, corporates as well, which are increasingly becoming multinational. Um, our role is to, to work with industry, represent industry, um, but also um, to show some leadership on, on change. Um, and that cuts across things around controversial areas around obesity and chronic diseases, as well as malnutrition, uh, food safety, and also sustainability, which primarily relates to food waste and sustainable packaging. Our role internally in the organization is to have quite uncomfortable and difficult conversations with regional CEOs, but also um, with uh, food safety, quality, innovation, R&D, and regulatory affairs people within the companies uh, about how we are being progressive and how we're trying to make change and reach some of those SDG goals specifically um, and, and contextualizing that for Asia as well, obviously, because there are some fundamental differences between what some of the global groups do and what we're doing on the ground in Asia. And what specifically are you doing on the ground? Okay, so one area specifically, um, which is, uh, is on track now, is, is a reformulation drive. And I know that's been talked about uh, this morning with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, what we've done is uh, try to um, uh, initiate a drive 
not just amongst multinationals, but SME community as well, which dominate uh, food and beverage markets in, in across many parts of Asia, um, to reformulate their portfolios. Now, um, obviously, some might sigh and say, well, you know, you're just doing sugar, salt, and fat. Well, that's the starting process in many markets in Asia Pacific, I'm afraid. That's where we are. Um, and so the goal is reducing sugar, sap, sugar, salt, and fat content in many of the packaged food products, but also looking at um, how we're putting in uh, via fortification, um, also via proteins and fibers, um, and how we're creating some of those new products. Um, right now, what it doesn't quite address is that bottom of the, the, the pyramid with affordable uh, and accessible, nutritious um, um, foods. Um, but we're still working on that, as are other groups as well. Well, it's a great way to bring in Nancy into this conversation. Yeah. Nancy, why don't you introduce yourself and your organization and talk, your, your organization is focused on the U.S. Yes. And, and many of the issues that we've heard about from the institutional, the government, and the regional, uh, the Asia region. Tell us, first of all, who you are, what you're doing, and how you're disrupting, and how you're addressing the challenge where Matt ended of bringing these issues to, to, the, to, the, to the, a universal community. So we're not just talking about the affluent, the middle class, but yeah. we're also talking about the underserved and the poor. Yeah, thanks, Earthrend. Um, I'm Nancy Roman, and I run Michelle Obama's Partnership for a Healthier America. And we were really created because the Obamas understood that business would have to be a big piece of everything and that the White House couldn't be completely entangled in that. So over the past decade, we've partnered with 300 organizations to real, remove seven trillion calories from the marketplace, working with companies, hospitals, universities, remove literally tons of salt, fat, and sugar. What we're finding is that the reformulation play has slowed, and we've also seen that um, if we're not careful, this revolution is going to happen in the tip-top of the socioeconomic pyramid and not necessarily spread. So in the last couple of years, we've really tried to bring the lens of equity. How can we impact those mo disproportionately affected mm -hmm. by diabetes and heart disease and, and obesity? And that work has taken us really into convenience stores, 75% of which are located in food deserts. So we're working with nine big convenience store chains to get healthier, better foods in. And then they said, but we can't get the healthy stuff. So we went upstream to the distributors. And um, I could go on for a long time about the work, but I think the big challenge for all of us in this room is to really think about how do we democratize this movement? Um, we're taking salt, fat, and sugar out, but we're doing it largely through consumer packaged goods stores. Over the next 10 years, we're looking to quick serve restaurants, and frankly, even the built environment. We have to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a real opportunity for those of us working with business to sort of think of things differently. Mm -hmm. a wor one word keeps coming up, and that is partnerships. Uh, and we know that the word partnerships, collective action, collaboration, are becoming buzzwords in our yeah. industry. That they, 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 too often they're words that we use, but not really how we perform. So I, I, I start with you, Mr. Minister. Uh, then from a government standpoint, how do we move from just using the words to actually supporting what's necessary to build a trust and the communication required to support real partnership. What role does government play in moving us to true partnership action? Yeah, it's a very important and uh, truly you know, tricky questions. Uh, it has to do with the, uh, uh, building a trust and uh, you know, creating a confidence among different partners. Actually, it has to do with uh, believing each other as well as bringing, for that to happen, um, it's really, in real sense, uh, we need to bring different actors together. Uh, uh, actually, uh, it has also to do with how uh, you have uh, favorable policies, you know, that uh, really prompt private sector to come in and invest in this very uh, endeavor. 
Uh, as far as uh, different entities of government are concerned, even you know some sort of problem lies over there. I mean, we should be very much honest. You know, uh, bringing different actors together and uh, you know having a real, in real sense, coordination and communication is a different, difficult job. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't lose the hope. Uh, we should uh, keep on trying. And one of them, uh, what I believe is that uh, that you uh, create enabling environment by providing incentive to different sectors so that they come together and uh, join hand with the government. For example, in Nepal, we have recently you know, enacted uh, Food Sovereignty, Food Right uh, and Food Sovereignty mm -hmm. Act. And that is one of the most glaring example in this regard. And uh, we have been implementing a multi-sector nutrition plan. And we have a provision of a steering committee at the national level. And that sort of national steering committee goes up to the grassroots level. And in each committee, we have a provision of the private sector and civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. So trust uh, can be built up with a repeated you know, interaction and mm -hmm. um, you know, supporting each other, collaborating in different uh, activities. I, I look at you, Diane, because as, the, as, as Kieran was talking about bringing together private sector into this, and, and so I can tell you were jumping at the bit, so why don't I let you come in right now and talk about how you think the business uh, can build that trust and communication that's necessary to support your partners. You know, Earthrun, I think it's so important. It was one of these points where trust has really eroded. And it's quite difficult often to have meaningful outcome-oriented conversations, particularly as we interact as business with different ministries. Mm -hmm. You know, I think having a conversation with land, environment, economic ministries is easier, frankly, than having conversations with health ministries. But if we can all work that conversation together to a point where we can get clear on what is the role of business as we go down the reformulation journey, as we go through the accessible and affordable aspect, but even things like infrastructure and how we really get access to markets for smallholder farmers and some of the innovations that need to occur within the base so that we can, as business, access, lift, use, and then distribute. So there's very tangible reasons to want to have that level of collaboration so that we can talk and learn to trust and figure out what are the actual place-based solutions that are so important to actually having a successful outcome. Mm -hmm. And coming from a place of global business, regional, big regional businesses, even understanding those place-based solutions is not something that can be done in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So if we're not working together and partnering together on the ground with government, with civil society, with community leaders, mm -hmm. we're not gonna have sticky solutions that really last. Mm -hmm. And because of the urgency of the transformation that we're talking about and the pace with which mm -hmm. isn't well enough understood, but that we all know we have to move with, we've got to be able to find ways to build that trust quickly enough to get to solutions that can really be impactful and last. And business has a big role to play in that. Mm -hmm. We recognize that. That's what we really want to be able to bring forward. I, I, I smile and I, I, I think, uh, uh, Nancy, as you were talking before about bringing in, the democratizing mm -hmm. yes. this conversation uh, yeah. and the, the role that donors play yes. in ensuring democratization of this conversation. Yes, because Kar Karan and Diane mentioned trust, which is so important, but it's also time. I have been struck since I've been here um, and I've had a chance to meet so many of you, how many of your work overlaps with mine considerably or would benefit from collaboration. And the donor community, especially in the nonprofit space that I'm in, funds new programs and new programs, but is less inclined to fund the connective tissue of bringing people together. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of been at this too long to be too romantic about m and in the nonprofit space, but we do have to acknowledge we don't have the creative destruction of capitalism, so we, we need to come together and understand what one another are doing so that we can leverage and build on each other's work. Even just the conversation we were having backstage among us, uh, there is opportunity for collaboration and aiding and abetting. So I think if, if funders could help facilitate that, it could go a long way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And let me uh, go to you, Charlotte. And, and you mentioned briefly the, the Food Summit. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about collaboration, coming together for a summit, 
what's going to make this one different that makes it more than a summit and actually an opportunity for all of the interested parties to come together and collaborate in a different way? How are you going, how is the summit being designed to build that trust that's been talked about? So we're working with many partners, many are here today, and we work, for example, with the World Economic Forum, the platform for food systems. Uh, I think the UN has a great convening power in building these partnerships with private sector, with foundations, and uh, we will already start at uh, the GA in September at the UNGA to work together, and we'll also link it to the climate summit, because obviously we have to think in a very holistic way. And then in 2021, we will have built up to that in a way that is very um, tangible and active through different events. So I believe this will be um, really changing the lives of the rural farmers that we're here to help. Let me go to you, Matt, for a second and talk to us. You, you talked about reformulation and what you're doing with large businesses. What public policy change, if any, do we need to make to support the enabling environment that's required for business to invest in the changes that are necessary to drive the, and catalyze uh, the, the, the ecosystem changes required for us to improve our food system. Okay, so let, let me take a step back one on, on an example on, on reformulation first, and then, I'll, and then I'll go on. Um, in terms of the policy environment, to encourage SMEs to do that more, um, you've got quite progressive governments like Singapore, who have actually already initiated some programs to support SMEs with the reformulation drive. Because a lot of the problem is that with SMEs, they say, look, they didn't either have the time, the R&D, the innovation, or, or the willingness to actually reformulate their portfolios. So what they've implemented was something called a healthier um, ingredient scheme with up to about half a million dollars to support those small companies with their, um, with their reformulation drive. Even to the extent, if they were to hit a certain nutrition um, criteria and those, pro those products are considered more healthy, then the government would support with a, a healthier choice logo system to promote those as well. I would say that's actually very, very progressive. Okay, as a, as a tool that a government could use. Not all governments have the money, but at least now you've got um, the Indian government that are looking at that scheme as well. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and, and that's an opportunity. In terms of other policy making, look, you can take the, the stick approach, and I think we've seen that in, in the US and Europe um, and in the UK as well, and that's worked to a certain extent. Um, I mean, we would like to see more, more incentives, um, certainly uh, more incentives for, for startups as well and, and SMEs that are trying to build out products um, that are more affordable and nutritious as well. And then how they get, um, how, how they can promote those products and then get them into the supply chain as well. So that's, that's something that uh, uh, FIA, working with the big companies, but also with startups and some of the um, investors, we're looking at how, how we are being a, an enabling environment to, to try and um, support that. And what I would put out there as well is that, um, I think what the Sun Business Network are doing on this as well, um, around their pitch competition of working on with entrepreneurs, both in, in Africa and across Asia, Asia, to try and draw attention to some of those, those smaller startups that are more nimble and more willing to, to, mm -hmm. to be more in this space because it's quite difficult for big companies to, to change in certain ways is, is very progressive indeed and we would definitely support an initiative like that. Well, we can't talk about public policy, Kieran, without going to you as a government representative. And, and Nepal is such an interesting place because after the earthquake, there was the entire global humanitarian community came to your aid, but they go away. But your government has stepped up and has, has made some significant policy changes, and you've had changes in government. Can you speak to and tell the audience about what are the, some of the public policy changes that have actually been implemented by your government and the difference that they've made? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, very interesting, actually. Uh, government used to be a unitary monarchical system. Uh, and um, I mean, it became republic almost a decade back. And recently, we promulgated a constitution also. We used to be a unitary state. Now, there are uh, one federal government and seven provincial government and 753 uh, local level government and all autonomous in a way. So it has uh, posed us a challenge as well as opportunity. Challenge in the sense that it's really difficult to bring all these government together and coordinate with each other, especially in our agenda, especially agenda of food security, agenda of, uh, you know, sustainable food system. 
So that is a challenge, and uh, we are we are uh, striving towards uh, that end by sensitizing them. You know, still at the local level, the agenda of the government is uh, physical infrastructure rather than this agenda. You know, food system, food security, food standard, and then uh, just we can't imagine the you know participation of the private sector at this stage. So we really need to make them capable enough to handle these issues. Number one is this. And uh, at the state level also, at the provincial level also, they are very uh, in a primitive stage. Uh, and uh, the federal government at the moment is very stable with the two-third majority. So a lot of new policies are coming into scene, especially you know, um, incentivizing the private sector uh, into the business. And there is a lot of confidence that is being created. And, um, and after this government, actually, we have launched a multi-sector nutrition plan second, which is uh, under uh, operation at the moment. And uh, very soon, uh, from July 16 of this year, we are launching uh, another periodic plan of five years. Mm -hmm. And that has really focused uh, on the participation of the uh, private sector, along with the civil society organizations. We believe that mm -hmm. you know, development of Nepal is not possible with the due participation of the private sector and civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have uh, really um, uh, striving uh, hard, but the reality is that I have already mentioned some of the data are alarming. Mm -hmm. Actually, almost uh, more than 50% of the households are food insecure, and standing is almost 36%. So we really need to work hard, but mm -hmm. we have done remarkably well in terms of Stunting. It was almost 57% in 2001 mm -hmm. and uh, has come back to 35.8%. Mm -hmm. So a lot of changes are happening and uh, we are really struggling and uh, we are very hopeful mm -hmm. for the bright future of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm, I'm looking at you, Diane, because you, you listen to the minister talk about specifically what's happening in... Um, in Nepal regarding public policy and how it's bringing in business. And so speak to us from a, gov from a, national, from a global level yeah. of the type of public policy that your businesses that you represent, that what kind of public policy do they require in order to support an enabling environment for them to perform differently? One of the things that I really enjoyed about what the minister has said in the example of the Nepalese government is the integration of the policies across these ministerial bodies. And that's actually much of the enabling environment that business needs. We need policies that make sense and work together rather than in competition. We find often that trade policy is not really aligned with agricultural um, food security policy for in-country. We need food safety programs that make sense at the government level, but we also need to be able to have those lined up with the nutrition and health priorities because that's often what's driving big GDP risk and business may not have full uh, impact to be able to really play into what that could shift into. So we at the WBCSD are actually looking at right now, how do we develop a much more cohesive set of policy asks mm -hmm. that business can bring forward around the health and nutrition, the land use and nature-based solution space so that we're connecting much of what we were able to ask for in climate with what we need to be paying attention to around land and biodiversity and to what we really need to do to address human health and nutrition and create a consistent framework within which we can really move and accelerate the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward to bringing that into the Global Climate Summits, mm -hmm. UNGA, but then equally into the trend of these nature conferences, into the food conferences, so that when we're talking at national levels, subnational levels, and at global levels, we can be much more consistent around what really helps aid the transition. On the same point, Nancy, you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in based on your original question about disruption. Yes. And thinking about, you know, policy and the opportunity ahead for policies. And I'm thinking of two trends in the next decade, which are the food revolution and the digital revolution. And sometimes I think when we're all, me too, thinking about policies, we're shackled by what was, and we're trying to incrementally improve policy. And taking your point about disruption, I'm wondering, you know, the digital opportunity, you listen to what's been said for two days, yeah. it's marketing, 
it's tie the consumer into this. Mm -hmm. If we could have transparency on labels so that consumers knew with this digital revolution coming and this food revolution coming, could we sort of leapfrog to a whole new place with policy and could business and government help? Traceability, transparency, driving into education, yes. supporting awareness, leading to action. Yes. You know, all, all, all is really sex, but <laughs> let me, let, let, let's, let, I, I, I want to turn to Charlotte for a second because the, there's, there's some reality that we need to bring into this conversation. Because the, the things you're saying are right in, in, in the north. And yeah. the challenge that we have, and, and I look at, at you, Charlotte, because recent data shows that only 3% of private sector investment uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa goes to staple crop value chains. That the, yes, we are seeing an increase in agricultural investment, but it's going into coffee, uh, cocoa, uh, some now in nuts, but the, the things that are going to pr provide affordable, nutritious food to ensure that we're changing the numbers that we're talking about, money's not coming. What's EFAT doing to address this challenge? So as we know, it's the smallholder farmers, the family farmers that are producing the food of the world globally. And we understand that we need to invest more. As we are an investor, we do loans and grants for governments. Uh, we have also started now a new fund, which is the Agribusiness Capital Fund, where we will work with uh, small and medium-sized companies that are in agribusinesses to help them to, um, to grow. And we also work on the capacity building of um, the agribusinesses. Uh, it's a fund that's funded by Luxembourg and the European Commission, and it was started in February this year. So we hope this will be one way of um, bringing more investment into this sector in developing countries. We're focusing on Africa to start, but we're also open to Latin America and to Asia. That's exciting. The focusing on providing access to more nutritious food is appropriate, but there have been two studies recently published that suggest that merely making affordable food more accessible doesn't necessarily change consumer demand or consumption, and as a result doesn't necessarily change BMI. Um, and so from a, I go first to you, Matt, from a, from a business standpoint, working with the businesses that you work with, what are, what are the kinds of things that business should do to change consumer demand for um, more nutritious foods? So it's, a, it's a tough question, um, but it's a good one. Um, so look, the, the, the power of many of the big companies in terms of their marketing prowess is, is obviously well known, right? Um, and, and so there is, um, there is an opportunity to try and harness um, some of that expertise um, and working with the public sector on how we promote um, and how we create um, environments to nudge consumers towards more healthier options, okay? Um, some of that work is actually there's a potential for a, a pilot to be done between FIA and actually the World Food Program on this um, in Singapore and Indonesia, looking at how we try and encourage more of the food companies to be more responsible in their marketing efforts. Mm -hmm. But meantime, also, how do you make those nudges and those pushes towards consumers to, to change their behavior? Um, there are traditional methods to do this um, in terms of labeling, but I'll tell you honestly, I don't think that a label on a packet is really going to change someone's behavior necessarily. There has to be a little bit more, more to it than that. Um, and I, I think uh, I, don't have, I don't have an answer for that one right now, but um, if you can harness that power from, from the big multinationals to be more, more responsible in their marketing and support some of the public, or, uh, public sector initiatives with marketing, um, more uh, consumption of fruits and vegetables, um, that's going to be beneficial. We, we actually are starting that process in, in Indonesia with the World Food Programme on how we market um, greater consumption of fruits and vegetables with um, uh, secondary school children, mm -hmm. primarily girls in, um, in urban areas in Jakarta. Um, so we're, we're in that process of, of, of trying to test something to see if it works and then how we, how we potentially can scale that. Now, Nancy, your organization is doing some interesting things around driving we're, consumer demand. We are, actually. We're, um, we're piloting something in artificial intelligence right now, which I think hold, holds some real potential. Um, an artificial intelligence company in Palo Alto called Eversight. I noticed when I went to the Food Marketing Institute that 
um, that's the big retail conference in the United States, that there were about 50 um, digital companies and artificial intelligence companies there really wanting to market to them. And you begin to realize that as advertising moves the, to the digital platform, we could really be about to widen the health disparity because, you know, if you eat, you know, fresh vegetables and lingonberries and superfoods and I eat the bologna on sale and supersized chips and the 24-pack of Coke when it's on sale and you get optimized digitally for what you choose and I get optimized for what I choose, we could see things going like this. So we went to this company and said, you know, can you work with us? And so right now we're running a pilot in a giant supermarket in Ward 8 with Eversight Labs to try to suppress sales of this sugar water called Sunny Delight, which is the number one quickest selling item, and to increase, accelerate sales of fruits and vegetables. And once we get that data, if it works, I think it's something that could scale. Um, mm -hmm. But I did want to respond to something Matt said. I, I don't think labeling is the panacea, but I do think um, that we've got to sort of like one-two punch this. There is a sector of the consumer base that will pay attention and is leading this plant-forward revolution that cares is their added sugar, that cares how much sodium. And it may not be the ones at the bottom of the socioeconomic pyramid, but they're a significant, they could be a significant leader if we could have more, you know, visibility. But, um, they're kind of... I, and, okay, go ahead. Just very quickly, I completely agree with both of what Matt and Nancy have said. I think, though, when you ask about digitization, how do we mm -hmm. use technology, there's a big part of that relative to consumer-facing input, but there's a big aspect around how do we use that to drive improved productivities and yields mm -hmm. and on-farm income, therefore, particularly for smallholder farmers, where we really have a big gap in access to good data, good weather data, good market access data. We've got some really interesting programs, uh, for example, Cocoa Cloud in Eastern Af uh, Western Africa, where we're looking to bring real-time weather data for market access, not just for cocoa and the integrated cropping systems, but for kitchen gardens that they have as well for their own nutrition. And so there's a lot of ways that it's important that data can be used in that sense. So we have a few minutes left. I'm going to very ask you very quickly to go down the side. I'm going to start with you, Kieran. Um, what commitment are you prepared to make sitting on this stage today that will make, from your government standpoint, that will make a difference mm -hmm. for addressing the challenges of our food system. Right. Uh, I have a, I mean, great realization after participating here. You know, government is a guardian. It has every, I mean, responsibility to bring all these stakeholders together. Actually, we need to make a persistent effort. Let's not lose the heart. Keep on trying, number one. And there should be political commitment and bureaucratic commitment as well. And uh, also, you know, this uh, collaboration, multi-sectorality. Mm -hmm. That is very important at this moment to ensure, you know, a sustainable food system uh, in Nepal as well as all over the globe. So bringing people together, convene, using your convening power. Right. Okay, Charlotte, what's EFED ready to do? What so commitment think, are you making? I think coming up to Agenda 2030, I mean, we're all uh, working together towards this framework for food systems and the Food Systems Summit. This is something we'll be focusing on. Okay, Diane? We commit to bringing business leadership behind the transformational pathways where we have to act across the system all the way down fork to fork, to farm, farm to fork, and bringing those into these types of big convenings and discussions. So, Matt, putting you on the spot, what are you prepared to commit so, to? Um, to our, our, my, my commitment uh, really with FIA is that we really want to work with um, the public sector and also civil society and academia on some of the projects that they're doing that, that, and solutions that, uh, that we could collaborate on with, with industry as well. That um, probably doesn't happen enough in Asia and we're really committed to doing that and I'd like to have a conversation with those because our leadership uh, within FI, which is many of the regional CEOs of the big multinational companies are, are willing to have that conversation and listen to what those solutions are. Yeah. Nancy, what's your commitment? Two points of focus. One, uh, we've developed a framework for quick serve restaurants to help roll out the Eat Lancet targets in collaboration with CIA and others doing that. That's where people are eating in the United States of America. 
And second, really to serve as a leader pulling together like organizations so that we're not stepping on each other, we're working together. So those are great commitments. I ask everyone in this office, stand audience, stand up right now. <laughs> everybody goes. We, we have to stand up as well. Turn to your person next to you and make a commitment. This isn't about a meeting, it's about change. What are you committing to? I'm pulling us together. <laughs> <laughs> so Not kissing together. each other. <laughs> what are you committing to to make change? Let's leave this yeah. EAT Summit committed to making a difference, to providing a sustainable food system, not just for those who are sitting in this room, but for those who are depending upon us to make that change. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Right. Timing good. is good. Good job. Okay. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, Thank guys. You. Thank you.